Good afternoon, listeners. This is your DJ, DJ McClanahan, here in the studio again with another actor in my studio. Right here, right now, we're going to interview Mr. Howard Rowland. In person, Howard Rollins presents a very different, more casual figure than the severe, angry, well-spoken men he's portrayed in films like Ragtime and A Soldier's Story. So much so, in fact, that when he showed up at the Columbia Pictures building on Fifth Avenue in dreadlocks and a black leather coat to do publicity for a soldier's story, the guards didn't recognize him and wouldn't let him pass, even though the lobby was full of nearly life-size posters of Rollins as Captain Davenport. It was early in the afternoon when I first met Rollins. I remember the very first time he asked for a shot of Jack Daniels and a beer. <laughs> he was quite guarded and serious at first and became progressively more voluble. He had just finished uh, one television movie playing a cocaine pimp in, in Children of Times Square, and he was preparing to play an FBI agent in the Johnny Gibson story. He said he was eager to do a stage play, but everything he'd been offered was insufficient. Can you say a little bit more about that, Henry? Uh, I'm sorry, Howard. Maybe uh, tell us a little bit more about that, Howard. Uh, tell us, uh, what, what do you want when it comes to uh, theater work? Man, when I get on stage, I want to have my ass kicked. I got to have something that when it's over, the only thing I can do is go get a drink. That's what being on stage is about. It's one chance to get a straight through orgasm. No coitus interruptus like filmmaking is, where just before you bust a nut, somebody says, Cut, all right, hold it. In a play, you can just go all the way through to orgasm. And that can wear you out if you get a good one. But that's what I want. All right, that's a very interesting way to describe it. Uh, did you always want to be an actor? No, I really didn't. Growing up, uh, what was there to emulate? I had no desire to walk around in tuxedos with trades. I had no desire to be, uh, as Lena Horne puts it, the part you can cut out when they get to Alabama. I wanted to be something that was integral to the piece. Acting came to me sort of the, as, a, as a surprise. When I was 16 or 17, I read for the part of Crooks, the stable book in, of Mice and Men, as a favor to a friend. When the director called me back to say I got the part, I didn't even remember the audition. But if there's anything in my life that's come close to perfect, it was my being introduced to theater. I thought it, I th I thought it was great. It, it, it blew my mind. It gave me a theme. And no one had to tell me, Howard, you have to speak this way. Don't turn this way. On stage, you can't do this or that. You know, it, it all just made sense until opening night when I, re I, I, I refused to go on and, and, I, and I, you know what I did? I'll tell you what I did. I ran back and I hid in the prop room. I said, you didn't tell me there's going to be people out there. Shit. The director, the director said, hey, don't, don't do this to me, Howard. Come on now. And he, and he literally, in my cue, shoved me through the door. Now, luckily, my character could stumble, so I stumbled down the stairs. I was just frightened of people. Now, then once I got up there, it became that strange thing that one enjoys, which is being able to pretend it's very normal to have people looking at the crack of your ass. Now, that, then when the show's over, you say, okay, you paid your money, you can't see anymore, and now it's mine. I never stood around waiting for accolades like others did. I was always the first one out of the theater from the very beginning. And when I went to college, it was neck and neck between French and theater. I was going to be a French teacher because my sister was a teacher. And I thought at least I could do that. I studied French for eight years, all through junior high and high school, and two years in college before I dropped out. I was working in a TV studio in, uh, in, in Baltimore doing some, some sort of a, a public service soap opera, uh, dramatizing the problems of the city. And I was, a, I, I was a little disappointed in school, so I thought, why don't I just work full time? They kept going from then on. All right. At what point did you consciously decide to become an actor? I'd say when I did that first play in 67. That was, that was the greatest thing I ever discovered, that I, that I could get up on stage and actually do that. I had no trouble with lines. I, I learned them very fast, and I understood the act of creating and playing and getting out of myself into somebody else. I knew then that I wanted to be an actor. And why do you think you were able to do that so immediately? 
Uh, I don't know. I don't know why. I guess it's a, it's a chance to express things I really got a chance to express in my ordinary life, except with my best friend. I just wanted to act. I didn't know. I didn't know where it would go ultimately. My sister, who's older, she said to me at one point, "Well, you know, baby, black people don't become movie stars." I said, "I don't care. I want to be an actor." I never thought about it consciously. What about any formal training? Did you ever study acting formally? Nah, not really. There, there, there was uh, there was some acting class we had in twelfth grade, but that teacher all he talked about was his antique store. Then you get to college and you have acting one, which is improvisation, you know, playing fried eggs and blades of grass, stuff like that. And then acting two, where you blow a kiss at Shakespeare. But that, that's not studying. First day of July 1974, I came to New York. When the public service soap opera ended after four years, I thought I'd save some money to go to New York. I started substitute teaching, which was not saving money. And I took over driving a bus. I happened to call my sister-in-law one time because I was going to visit her in D.C. And she started crying on the phone saying, Oh, God, I hear you're driving a bus. You're a good actor. Don't be, don't be like the rest of the family. Don't wait for years and years and then say you could have done this, you could have done that. Just do it. And ten days later, I was in New York. So I moved into the YMC on 63rd Street and started walking around trying to learn the city a little bit. I spent a lot of time just sitting around Lincoln Center watching people going to the theaters and stuff. I even saw Patti LaBelle with her band rehearsing for their, uh, their Wear Something Silver concert at the Met. I was sitting on the steps, and they were out there taking pictures for this, this magazine. And a feather came off one of her dresses, and I kept that feather for the longest time. That's interesting. That that's a, I love that. You were uh, you were in streamers at some point, weren't you? Isn't that one of the plays you did? Yeah, I was in uh, I was in it the last eight months of its run. Uh, one day, Mike Nichols came back to tighten it up for the Tonys or something. And I stayed there while he reworked the whole show. Basically, it was really interesting to watch him work. He'd say, "Nope, that's a tape. That's a tape. You're playing a tape. Erase it. Go back to the real thing." The only thing he said to me was, I, I hear you're pretty good. I'm, I'm glad to meet you. I'll tell you what, when he said that, I almost shit myself. Now, when you came to New York to act, did you, uh, did you think you'd also do movies, or just uh, did you just have theater in mind? Well, I, I, I really didn't think about movies. I've done some television in Baltimore, uh, some commercials even, nice commercials, not just not just advertising Benny's Pizza Parlor, but I didn't come to New York thinking about movies. I came to New York thinking about acting. I figured if you want to be an actor, you do it in New York. I never thought, I really, I, 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 just, I just didn't think about California at all. I only thought of going to New York for the stage. It was the only place to go. Was Ragtime the first movie you ever made? No, uh, it'd be uh, it'd be the second. For, first movie I made was a was a thing called House of God about medical students in their first year of internship. It starred some people who went on to get some nice work, like Tim Matheson, who always does those uh, get the pussy movies, and Charles Hay from Hill Street Blues, Bess Armstrong, Sandra Bernhard, Joe Piscopo was in it. It was directed by Daniel Rye. Oh, it's not D Daniel. What the hell am I thinking? Donald. Donald Rise, directed by him. His, his other film was, uh, uh, what was that, uh, uh, Robbie Benson film called Ice Castles, about a kid going blind or something. I, I didn't I didn't see it. So, House of God got you lots of work, huh? No, because no one saw it. After that, Ragtime came, and I went to the Gulf and Western building and met Milo's foreman for about 15 minutes, and we talked. I'd just seen hair, and I, I loved I loved the movie. So after talking to him, I got to the door and I thought, I don't give a fuck what he thinks. And I turned around and said, I, I really liked hair. I thought, I thought he might say, oh sure, you liked hair. You probably liked it if I did Betty Boop meets Tolstoy. But I meant it. You know, he, he said, oh, thank you very, very much. And then I, then I left. Then I got a call back and I met him again. I met him three times all together and I screen tested two scenes. Then I went away to do a TV movie in France as Glenn Turman. And when I came back five weeks later, I figured I didn't have it. And I walked into the agency and the secretary said, Hello, Cole House. I, 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 I'm telling you, I, I almost shit on myself.
I, I couldn't believe it. Did you know other people were up for that? Yeah, like O.J. Simpson. Yeah, you know, make me puke. I saw him in the makeup room before we did the shoot. You know, LeVar Burton was there. There was talk of Lou Gossett, who somebody said was too old, and Richard Pryor, who by that time had burned himself up with that rum drink that didn't do right. <laughs> So he was out of the running. Uh, somebody said 200 guys were over that part. What would you say is the hardest part for you of, uh, with respect to being an actor? What's the hardest thing for you to do as an actor? I'd say to finish a good job, leave, and know that it's over. With ragtime, for instance, working with a director like that and a cast like that and feelings like that for five months, it's almost unrealistic. The you know, closeness you have, they, they, I mean, you, you need to have that immediately. And for that to be over really bothered me. And the last day of shooting in London, I just, I, I just made it out of the studio up to my dressing room before I burst into tears. I'm, I'm telling you, if I'm not working, I'm usually alone, and I, and I don't do that well. Acting is fine, but socially I'm not very good. I'm like an octopus on speed in a china shop. All the Waterford crystal comes down to the floor, all the steuben glass. But if I have a character to be behind, I can have fun with it. Now, that's my world. I'm not good at dating or meeting people. My life is not conducive to normal relationships. There's a part of me that always, always wants to be normal. But I'm not normal. I never have been normal. I've always been a strange little fuck. And I've gotten used to it. And when I'm acting, I know how to tie it down. How to use it. And when I'm not working, I get really bizarre. Yeah, I've heard uh, I've heard other actors talk like that. You know, they they just admit, you know, look, uh, I'm not like the rest of the people that are, at least most of the people that are in the world. Actors are different, they're different kinds of people, different kind of machines, I guess you might say. But with respect to actors out there uh, on the scene, have you are there any that you'd look to, uh, look to as uh, role models or inspirations for your career? Well, yeah, there are actors I look in, I say, man, god damn, they're hot. You know, John, John, oh, man, John Hurt in 1984, whoo, and Richard Byrne in 1984. Man, those two motherfuckers are incredible. And and De, De Niro is, mm, man, that motherfucker must have come out of his motherfucker's, I'm tell, he must have come out of a motherfucking womb with a little teeny tiny script clutch in his hand. Like those teeny tiny cartoon books you get in the Cracker Jack boxes. He had to have had. He's unbelievable. The work that Paul Winfield did, that used to blow my mind, too. I really thought a lot of him. And I, I just, I, I, think the, I think those guys are brilliant. Oh, uh, Glenda Jackson, she's still one of my favorites. <laughs> okay. And what would you say is the silliest thing about being an actor for you? Well, let's see. That's interesting. Well, let, me, uh, let me figure that out. Uh, one, one thing that always strikes me as silly is people who act like they don't have genitals. There's an actress right now on film who everybody wants and everybody begs for who's technically brilliant. But to me, I think th there's like, like a Barbie doll up under that dress. I can't believe there's a vagina there. And this woman has children, too. I cannot imagine her with her legs in the air in the throes of passion. I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, Mr. Rollins, i got to say, you've been one of the more entertaining people I've had in my studio for quite some time. I hope everybody out there enjoyed that. Mr. Howard Rollins here.